of Appeal sags Caleb Mufwang has plot to state governor, declares Netanwa Gushwe of APC as winner. Minister of Interior Olubumi Ojo flags of release of inmates, 4,068 set free. Use this opportunity to call on the larger community to receive these returning citizens with open arms. They should refrain from stigmatizing against them. National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, arrest wanted Abuja drug kingpin seven years after escape from prison. And on Good Morning Nigeria today, we shall review the just concluded Saudi Africa summit in Riyadh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. African leaders were in Riyadh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, for the first ever Saudi Africa summit, which began on Friday, the 10th of November, and has come to an end. That's right, uh, Demole, and the summit is to boost ties and promote stability between Africa and the Arab world. Leaders from more than 50 countries attended the summit, aimed at further developing relations and cooperation between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and countries in Africa towards promoting strategic partnerships. Uh, leaders who attended the summit included the presidents of Nigeria, uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, Kenya, Zambia, Djibouti and Mauritania, the Prime Ministers of Ethiopia and Niger, as well as the Foreign Minister of Egypt were in attendance. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia had appointed a Secretary of State for African Affairs in 2018 and has been actively involved in the region by providing counter-terrorism support to G5 countries and participating in peace negotiations in Sudan. Uh, that's true, and uh, one significant takeaway from the summit is that as part of its Vision 2030 plan to overhaul its economy, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has pledged to invest about $25 billion in Africa by the end of the decade. You're right, uh, Lenre. Also, Saudi exports to the continent worth $10 billion will be financed and insured until 2030. And the Saudi Fund for Development will finance development projects worth about $5 billion in the same time frame. Uh, more than 50 deals and uh, plenary agreements were signed during the summit in fields such as tourism, energy, finance, mining and logistics. And also stakeholders say the first Saudi African summit has demonstrated that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's commitment to Africa with new investment pledges and the Kingdom is emphasizing its leadership in Arab-African relations. For Nigeria, what are the major takeaways from the summit? These are more. The guests we have as assemble will provide answers to in the course of the program. I am Ademola Adiyi. Thank you for joining us on Good Morning Nigeria this Monday, the first episode for the week. And I'm Ian Ray John. I also welcome you to the program. We're reaching you from our studios here in Abuja, and it is live. As usual, uh, we'll bring you other segments of the program, which includes the highlights uh, of the morning news, a bit on business, and of course, I would have a new super review with Chukudio Kolu Gbaja uh, joining us uh, for that. But for now, let's have the morning news with Olajide Belo. Good morning, Olajide. Good morning, Yere. Good morning, Ademola. Thanks for joining us on the morning news. The Court of Appeal, sitting in Abuja, has nullified the election of Governor Kele Muftuanga Plateau State. The three-member panel of justices in a unanimous decision held at Mufang was not validly sponsored by the PDP as provided by the Constitution. The court held that the appeal of Nentawe Goshwe of the APC succeeds as the issue of qualification was both pre- and post-election matter. The panel agreed with the appellant that the failure of the PDP to comply with the order of the High Court 
of Plateau State sitting in just directing it to conduct valid ward and local government and state congresses before nomination its candidates for various effective posts was a breach of the law. In the light of this, the panel set aside the judgment of the Plateau State Governorship Election Petitions Tribunal for being highly inconsistent and breach of fair hearing by relying on expunged witnesses' statement to refuse Goshwe's petition. The panel ordered INEC to withdraw the certificate of return issued to Mufwang and issue a fresh one to Goshwe, who is the candidate of the APC. The federal government wants project managers to work with its renewed hope agenda to curb quackery and corrupt practices associated with project management. Secretary to the government of the Federation, Georgia Kume, at a program to mark this year's project management week in Abuja said it would go a long way in achieving results and saving lives. All the MDAs private sector and the citizens alike to always engage the services of the statutory, bo statutory bodies as a war against substandard products is a war we all must win. We look for Nigerians who have existing qualifications and we now train them and ensure they have the generic concept that they can apply. The Minister of Women Affairs, Edu Kennedy, is exploring different empowerment avenues to change the poverty narrative of Nigerian women. This time, the ministry is partnering a Chinese organization on ways to involve women in cattle rearing through the use of locally sourced materials other than vegetation. Give us all the modernized, uh, mechanized farming tools to get it easier for Nigerians to do this work, make more, get more proceeds without over-suffering themselves. Uh, the growing period is about at least uh, one and a half a year. But using, uh, but if just uh, feeding them with the feed producer out by our machines, um, the growing period can be shortened um, within eight, eight months. A notorious major distributor of illicit substances within the federal capital territory, Abuja, Ibrahim Momo, popularly known as Ibrahim Bender, has been arrested by operatives of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency during a raid of his hideout in Day Day area of the FCT. The drug lord was arrested with 56.9 kilograms of cannabis sativa and 42.7 grams of diazepam. In another raid in the same area, one Yusufa Ibrahim also was arrested with 75.3 kilograms of cannabis. Meanwhile, various NDLA operations across the country led to the arrest of various suspects dealing, including a massive operation covering more than 21 hectares of farmland, which led to the destruction of 52,500 kilograms of cannabis sativa at F1 in Nikiti State. Chairman Chief Executive Officer of the NDLA, while commanding officers and men of various commands, urges them and their compatriots across all formations of the agency to intensify the offensive against drug cartels as the U-Tide approaches. The air component of the Nigerian Air Force under Operation Wild Punch has sustained airstrikes against terrorists operating in the northwest and north central region of the country leading to the decimation of several terrorist elements in Igabi local government area of Kaduna State. NAF spokesperson Air Commander Edward Kapwet says the strikes followed credible intelligence confirming the presence of terrorist Kingpin Budari and his foot soldiers at Sauna Doka. Another strike targeting hideouts of Nasiru, brother of Budari, was also successful. Baderi, his brother, and their foot soldiers have been blamed for several attacks and kidnapping along Abuja Kaduna Highway, Kaduna Brininguari Road, and several communities in Niger and Kaduna State. More than 4,000 inmates have in jail terms for fines and compensations not exceeding 1 million naira can now breathe the air of freedom. These follows payment of their fines by philanthropic individuals, groups and corporate bodies as part of their corporate social responsibility. It's not something we're expecting and then it came to us unexpected so 
We are very happy and we thank the government for this very, very wonderful opportunity. And we are praying and wishing that we never go back to our wrong ways again. I'm a web designer myself, so um, I also came in and learned um, art work for designs and also how to also think about my people, about agriculture, so I have plans when I go out. I also use this opportunity to call on the larger community to receive these returning citizens with open arms. They should refrain from stigmatizing against them as it can drive them back to offending the law, which will further endanger the society. And that concludes the morning news. Good morning, Nigeria continues with Yere and Demon after the break. Don't go anywhere. Yeah, welcome back. If you are just joining us, you are on to Good Morning Nigeria on the network service on the of the NTA. And now we're moving to business news. The Securities and Exchange Commission SEC is set to drive infrastructure financing through the capital market. Details with Alika Okpanachi Arua. The Securities and Exchange Commission SEC has expressed the resolve to strengthen infrastructure financing through the Nigerian capital market in the coming year. The Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Lamido Yaguda, gave the hint while outlining the goal of the Commission in 2024 with a projection of a $3 trillion economy by 2026. You can make the right investment choices. You need to be financially literate. You need to know uh, what are the opportunities that you are pursuing in financial markets and also what are the risks you know, that you may encounter. And towards making the capital market more viable, stockbrokers are also exploring the potentials in the financial markets towards aggregating the required capital for funding long term. The WG growth of our economy will also be enhanced through the creation of many infrastructural projects that will just transform a lot of opportunities. We will be sharing this with the top echelon of government, with the federal government, with the various state governments, so that they can cooperate with all the public-private partnership partners that we have to bring forth this capital, aggregate it, and deploy it for uh, infrastructural growth and development. Uh, there's no better way to do that than through the capital market, for example. I uh, would love to see many more companies who, whether you list uh, locally with us in Nigeria, whether you tap markets uh, locally on the debt side, or through any of the other call it investment asset classes that we have, I uh, will be very welcome. Steps are also being taken towards rebranding the markets, attracting more investors, and regulating the activities of the capital market in line with global standards. With business news, Alika Okonachi, Arua. Thank you, Alika, for the business package. Uh, now time for newspaper review. back it's time for newspaper review and we have our reviewer here chooks hello good morning demola good morning and how was your weekend great i dare say mm. i've rested properly now okay and i'm rearing to go as usual okay you can uh, okay Mary, <laughs> how are you doing very well Jukudi. good to see you your colors are brilliant thank you all right, Mary. So let's uh, take a look at uh, some of the papers we have this morning. Uh, the Vanguard is here, as well as the New Telegraph. Quickly starting with uh, the Vanguard this morning, uh, we have uh, the lead story uh, with the kicker, Supreme Court rumble in judiciary over nomination of justices. And the writers, names on the FJS's list. Excellent. Professor Akin Shea George, SAN. And then this is credited to NJC and CGN, no cause for alarm. 
We can find the details on page 5 of the Bangad. Above the mustard, we have uh, State of the Nation. What Tinubu will force us to do? And that's coming from Bode George. Uh, on page 13, you can read up the story of, uh, you know, uh, what is happening in Plateau State. Uh, Appeal Court sacks Governor Motfwang declares Goshwe winner. I'm sure you want to uh, find out uh, what that verdict is about. And, uh, of course, uh, looking away from that, below the picture story, we have inflation. Declining demand triggers 20% fall in food beverage production. Details on page 27 of uh, the Vanguard. And that's it uh, from the Vanguard this morning. Uh, just uh, quickly taking a look at the new Telegraph now. We have the lead story here with the kicker. Lawyers, why governors must sign condemned prisoners' death warrants? Riders say refusal to do so, worsening prison congestion. Details on pages 14 and 16 of the New Telegraph. Just below the masthead, we have Bainwe Killings declared state of emergency over insecurity. Ex Senate President urges Alia. And next to that, we have CGN to swear in 58 new SENs. November 28, Serap budget other suitable over new Rex. Details on pages 3 and 4 of the New Telegraph. Above the masthead, we have CBN. Currency in circulation rises by 8.56% to 2.99 trillion naira. The rider, external reserves resume decline, lose $112.98 million. Below the picture story, of course, uh, the uh, story from Plata State is also right there. You want to find out what the appeal court verdict is all about and uh, the sack of the PDP governor in that state. The rider says verdict, a temporary setback, says Mutfuang. And uh, in uh, Thin Strip on page 26, you can find the details of prolonged time on tech devices harm children's brains. You want to hear that again? Prolonged time on tech devices harm children's brains. So that said much from the New Telegraph this morning. Yeah, and uh, I have the leadership newspaper above the name plates. We have the Supreme Court Judicial Council awaits list of nominees a story can be gotten on page seven israel amass war rages as outcry grows over gaza crisis the story also is on page 17. Um, be below the name plates briefing fast check why did court of appeals sack colonel governor trending terrorist attack governor Buni's convoy Cost of renewable energy may hamper Nigeria's target. That story is also on page 7. Uh, then I have the protest rocks plateau as appeal court sacks Governor Mufang. The story is also on page 7. 5,417,774 5 apply for police constable slots. Wow, that's a that's, that's big number. Oh, jukes. Yeah. Constable Cup, um, slot 547,774 apply for police constable slots. Are you calling it a big number? I think yeah. what, 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 it doesn't even reflect the rate of unemployment mm. in the country. Really? True. What choices do you have, really? And the, 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 the sad aspect of it is that about half of those who applied are applying for want of something to do. They don't genuinely want to be police officers. Mm. And that's not good for policing in the country. Mm. It's, not. it's like a, 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 a hanger on coming into journalism. He doesn't believe in fairness, factuality, objectivity, and balance. He's looking for a job. He's a dead weight in the newsroom. So, fine. I wonder how they're going to jostle and get those spaces. Whatever happens, I wish them luck. But it does reflect the rate of unemployment in the country. We should worry us a bit. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Also, uh, we have Nigeria 26 orders adopt HBV vaccine against cervical cancer. That's uh, page four. Police chief orders overage officers to retire. Mm. That's, that's another one. <laughs> that's another one. Yes. Uh, we're complaining that we have shortage of uh, police officers, but what can we do with the overage officers? They need to go. 
so yeah, that yeah. the younger ones can come in. Yes, you know, an institution has its rules and regulations. Yeah. When the time for those things come, they tell you, you just have to obey those rules and regulations. You do not, um, you know, uh, uh, you do not engage attitude which could set a bad precedent. Mm -hmm. You have to let them go when they should go, ask them to go when they should go. The question is this, how much are you reinforcing as you're depleting towards 65, 70 years and all that? Mm -hmm. Are you reinforcing, uh, you know? The problem from, is closing the gap. Exactly. Most of the time, you don't have a replacement. Because a gap does get created. Yeah, you don't. But, but the mother, I also and would ponder. In, in, in every structure, even in the civil service. Yes. Challenge. I would ponder to a feeling which you might not have expressed. The rate at which experience departs our service is a bit worrying. Mm. Mm. Alarming. Look at what happened in the army. Uh, I mean, uh, after the the, 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 the the new administration came in, people were asked to retire. Yeah. And some of them were almost kicking against it. I think we have to find a, a kind of equilibrium because nothing can buy experience. No, nothing. 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 Actually, that's the problem we are having, even in the civil service. Two you know? things troubling the newsroom at the moment. Many experienced people have left. Uh, and employers, particularly in the private uh, sector of it, yeah. are looking for young, upward, uh, mobile people. people. Where is their experience? How, why is it that there's a dearth of storytellers these days? It's because real stuff is leaving the newsroom. Okay. It's a depletion that worries me. There are factors responsible for um, the real stuff, like you put it, living yes. uh, either the newsroom or the civil service or the police or whatever it is. Um, I, th I think the fact that um, there is no, um, you know, credibility in the process. Say, say you have 10 people leave and then you replace them immediately, for example. They will be trained by the experienced ones still available. That's but what it. obtains is that uh, there's a vacuum. Like, they, they wait and then until 100 people leave and then they begin to say, oh, we want to now employ. Exactly. Who is going to train the people? And there's now a discontinuation in terms of who's going to pass over skills. Exactly. To the next. To the next. That's a very good so, one. So, yeah. so for me, that's, that's like a very good one. one of the challenges. That's and then, it. And then the fact that there's no improvement, you know, when it comes to the welfare of um, workers generally. It's also affecting the whole thing because young people are looking for, um, you know, faster way to make money, you know, all the things that are better. They're going into tech, they're going into so many things. Some want to leave the country and yes. all of that. So you want them to come into the civil service and then there's no training, uh, the remuneration is not so good, uh, welfare package is nothing to write them about. Is that so why you people are jack buying? <laughs> well, the jack buying is <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like it to comments. continue. The, now, to uh, add to what you just said, I don't denigrate any profession. No, I, I can't. I shouldn't. Everybody is important. I said when I was GM of a, a, a TV station in Jones that time, the, the worker I respected more than every other person was the cleaner. Because she cleaned the, the office with some kind of, it was something else. So it's not about denigrating anybody. But I think soldiers, medical doctors, nurses, and journalists should be given extra attention. I think so. I think so. Yeah. The fact, the fact, that, the fact, the fact that you added journalists to it, I would agree with you totally. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yeah, anyway, because they are essential but, services. But, but, Look but, at this one. But you know, Garlic, uh, ginger, takeover soup pots as onion prices soar. Wow. Yeah, do you have anything to say to that? That's a good alternative anyway, yes, because yes, it's a more beneficial. Alternative. I warned my daughter, you see those balls of onions? It was 6,000 a basket. So be careful how you use it. You know, <laughs> go to Okwe and, uh, you know, all those other spices that can help. They, 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 they decrease the number of onions that, that go into the support. And the girl laughed and said, Daddy, what is the fact? Very mm -hmm. true. And then I hear some people are beginning to go for the dried onions. Uh, oh, yes. Which one is the dried onions? What's that? Yes, there's, there's the dried one. It's packaged though. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. It's a bit affordable. Does it retain flavor? Uh, well, as, the long scent? As, as long as you have onion Aroma? <laughs> somewhere in the food. <laughs>
I hear her time is up. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, but just before we go, there's this story that I think that we should talk about. This prolonged time on tech devices harm children's brains. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a very um, important issue that we should talk about. And, you know, the fact that parents these days are very busy or, you know, the, you know trying to, uh, I mean, run around to keep the hope together. So yes. children are left with their phones, you know, the TV, the, the laptop and all of that. So our children are not growing up with... Um, their parents bonding and learning from them. They're not learning from their devices. And besides, you know, what you could, what could happen to the child when you stumble on what is not good for you, the fact that being on those devices itself can harm your brain, I think is something that we must begin to talk about just so that we do not have a generation of children if, that if, will have... If we don't get tech savvy at the rate things are going, Little we're going to harm worry. ourselves in the long run. I think so. You see, I said the other time, I, w um, I, I, I was sleeping with the phone just beside my head, and all of a sudden it vibrated, and I woke up with a terrible headache. headache. Mm. By the way, you know it's terrible wrong. It's wrong to sleep with your phone. It is wrong yes, to even yes. place your phone near so your bed. This is bird. a very important matter you're raising. We need to be tech savvy. The technology is so good. ICT taking over the world is fine. But it does have some disadvantages if you don't know how to use gadgets. True. Very true, important. True, true. Very important. Besides the brain, the eyes too. Um, a lot of children are you know, going to be having eye defects. Anything in a short connected time. to the brain. <laughs> That's it. Not only the eye defects. You know, very soon uh, you'll find people working like this because most times they are on their phone. And you know, before you know it, you're. What, what do you call this? This, this it, it, muscle cervical vertebra. Yeah, it will just be bent and just remain like that. Remain like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little tips that keep you away from the doctor. It's we don't seem to know many of them. We need, we need, we need um, a kind of enlightenment. We On do. This, yes. We sure do. Yes. And awareness. Even among so-called educated people. And also they need to... Okay. Larry. Uh, all right, uh, we need to go. Um, Ademola, many thanks for joining us again this morning. We hope to see you tomorrow bright and early. So that's a newspaper review for today. Uh, we'll take a break. When we'll come back, we'll get to our discussion. Chukudi, many thanks once again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Good morning, Nigeria is reaching you live on the network service of the NTA. Before we kickstart our conversation, which is... Uh, on the review of the Saudi Africa summit, let's take this background report put together by Abdul Salam Jibril. Since the 1970s, Saudi Arabia has been forging diplomatic ties with the African continent, and this was strengthened on 10th November 2023 when Nigeria's president, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, joined other African leaders in Riyadh for the first ever Saudi Africa summit. The three-day Saudi Arab African Economic Conference aimed to boost political and investment ties between African countries and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Several African countries used the opportunity to sign mouth-watering deals worth over $580 million intended to boost economic development and foster cooperation. For instance, Mozambique signed a financing agreement of $158 million with the Saudi Development Fund for infrastructure projects, including the construction of hospitals and a dam. Energy agreements were signed with Senegal, Chad, and Ethiopia, while the Saudis pledged it would help Ghana and other countries with their debt. President Tinubu, who led a nine-man delegation to the summit, moved Saudi investors to Nigeria insisting on the good returns generated by Africa's largest economy. On the table of discussion at the summit were issues revolving around supporting joint action against corruption and online fraud, enhancing political coordination, addressing regional security threats, and facilitating economic transformation through research. Both countries agreed to a series of investment and cooperation deals, including a pledge by the Saudi government to invest and revamp Nigeria's oil refineries and also provide financial support to sustain the government's foreign exchange reforms. Both countries signed a memorandum of understanding to promote collaboration, information exchange and technology transfer in the oil sector. Under President Bola Abnet Tinubu's leadership, Nigeria is committed to attracting business and investment by ensuring 
policy predictability, secure property rights, and effectiveness of contracts. Is this a new dawn for Nigeria-Saudi partnership? How soon will Nigeria begin to reap the benefits of the agreements signed at the summit? This will form part of discussions as guests speak to the Saudi African summit shortly. <laughs> Thank you, Jibril, for that uh, background uh, there. And uh, before we kickstart our conversation this morning, we spoke to the ambassador uh, of Nigeria to Saudi Arabia, Yahya Lawal, and um, here are his thoughts about the summit. My impression about um, the out in the first uh, summit, Saudi Africa summit, it was an excellent out in Amasi. The maiden version of the Saudi Africa um, meeting of leaders. And of course, the intention is to build a strategic partnership between the two uh, regions or the two sides. Um, and I think the objective for which the meeting was uh, convened, in my view, has been achieved. Um, the declaration that was issued by the Saudi uh, the host, the Saudi authorities, was a very comprehensive one. It identifies areas, new areas of cooperation between Africa and Saudi Arabia. As you know, uh, Africa is a neighbor of Saudi Arabia. Africa is the continent of the future. The Saudi recognize this importance, and this is why they want to develop a new partnership, a new fruitful, a mutually beneficial partnership uh, between um, the kingdom and Africa. So in my view, it was um, the Outen has achieved its objective, but um, uh, what remains is to see in the days to come, in the months to come, the implementation of the uh, declaration, the contents of the declaration that was adopted by the summit. Um, regarding the agreements that were signed, yeah, the, there were three agreements. Uh, one, an MOU on oil and uh, gas cooperation between Nigeria and Saudi Arabia was signed on um, the sideline of the summit. You also have, or also have an MOU to establish uh, the uh, the business council, uh, Saudi Nigeria business uh, council was also established, was also signed. Um, so we, uh, also have a third, uh, MOU, which is related to, uh, security. I, I think these are extremely important MOUs and agreements that will again further elevate Nigeria Saudi cooperation to higher levels. We are now waiting the two sides for the two sides to constitute the council with regards to the council. The two sides will now constitute the membership of uh, the council. And I believe this will happen very soon, considering the importance of this MOU in further strengthening uh, our economic cooperation. A lot of takeaways from this summit. But of course, don't forget... Um, uh, the president and commander in chief also held bilateral, uh, very fruitful bilateral discussions with uh, the Saudi crown prince. Uh, in attendance were quite a number of Saudi senior officials, ministers were present and uh, they had an, uh, far reaching, took far reaching, uh, um, reach, uh, they reached far reaching uh, accord to, um, to further uh, take steps that to strengthen Nigeria Saudi uh, cooperation. In this regard, of course, there was some decision for the two sides to work together within the next six months, for instance, to draw up a roadmap, a plan of action with timelines, with deliverable, deliverables, um, to, um, uh, so that these relations that are going to be um, uh, further developed in the next two, three years will have very concrete 
outcomes. And I think this is um, a very important achievement of the summit. Mr. President actually was extremely elated. And, uh, of course, uh, part of, uh, again, the takeaways, as we earlier mentioned, of course, the signing of these uh, agreements or MOUs and the Roundtable Business Forum, which brought together very um, uh, important investors, Saudi investors, together of Nigerian businessmen, of uh, Saudi officials, ministers in attendance. Um, who again, um, these uh, ministers and other stakeholders, according to what was agreed at the round table, will visit Nigeria very soon. Most probably, I think, by January, the first quarter of next year, so that the talks, the agreements that were reached can actually be uh, taken forward. I think it's um, the the takeaways are many, and then again the president met uh, and discussed with um, the management of the uh, Islamic Development Bank. As you know, it's a very strategic partner of Nigeria. Nigeria is one of the leading stakeholders in the IDB. So I think that again, uh, important discussions were held on how to reinforce uh, Nigeria. IDB um, a partnership and engagement. And um, I believe also in the next um, few weeks, we'll see a high level IDB uh, uh, visit to Nigeria. So these, in my view, are part of the important takeaways that we recorded during this summit. And finally, um, what does Nigeria need to do to benefit from the summit. Of course, we we need to we have taken some engagement, and I believe Nigeria is conscious of the responsibilities before her, and um, we know that we have to um, to build on this relationship that we have established uh, with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, with uh, other stakeholders, be the business, from the business perspective, on how we can reinforce our collaboration and bring um, and bring benefits to our people. I think this is the most important uh, thing to do. We are aware that um, of our economic situation, of course, and we need all partners to work together with, for them to support. Nigeria's economic uh, progress and prosperity. Uh, we want to bring as many investors as possible because it is through this that we can actually um, revitalize, revive the Nigerian economy and create jobs, most importantly, for our team in youth. Uh, so we, we have quite a number of responsibility to undertake we will also pursue the finalization and signature of some other agreements which have been pending. Um, with these agreements, when finalized and implemented, I think we will see an enormous boost in Nigeria-Saudi economic cooperation. I think these are a part of um, what uh, we should expect in the next um, weeks, month, and even years. Now, thank you. That was Ambassador Yahya Lawal, Nigerian ambassador to Saudi Arabia, sharing his uh, thoughts on the Saudi Africa summit. Yeah, um, uh, Leure, we will now have more uh, discussion. Uh, to join us for more this conversation on the Saudi Arabia summit, uh, we have joining us via Zoom is uh, the Abu Bakr Atiku Bagudu, Minister of Budget and Economic Planning. Honorable Minister, you're welcome to Good Morning Nigeria. Honorable Minister, can you hear us? Good morning. Yeah, you. Good morning, everyone. 
Okay, let me read. All right. Uh, also seated uh, here in the studio to discuss the topic uh, is uh, Minasara Kogo Umar, international analyst on democracy and uh, governance. Uh, you're welcome to Good Morning Nigeria, sir. Well, thank you very much. It's my honor to be here. Joining us from Amidu Guri Studio in Borno State is Ambassador Usman Saraki, the former Nigerian Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure joining you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's kick start our conversation with uh, the Minister uh, for National Planning and uh, Economic Planning, Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, uh, Bubaka Atiku. You were one of the delegation to the, uh, uh, to the summit. Can you give us an assessment of the whole summit? Good morning. But I, I guess the, I'm listening carefully and the Ambassador, Ambassador Yahya, Nigeria's Ambassador to Saudi Arabia have done a very, very good job, and I don't want to be sound redundant. However, I just want to add that Saudi Arabia being a country where annually at least 100,000 Nigerians visit is a very important country in terms of relationship with Nigeria. The relationships have evolved over the decades and the visit of President Aswa Jubola Ahmed Tinubu is one of the most remarkable visits that I have witnessed myself because the president was well received, Nigeria was well acknowledged, uh, the Minister of Investments of Saudi Arabia went as far as saying that they have followed Nigeria's campaign before the 2023 elections and they have been following all the campaign statements of our president, President Azua Yubola Metinibu, and they were not surprised with the bold and courageous measures he has taken because they are consistent with the campaign promises he has been seen, they have been seen. And they went as far as comparing the bold and courageous steps he has taken to the measures that were also being taken by the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, to, uh, to change Saudi Arabia. So they acknowledge our president's steps and they even liken them to their own, to what has happened because Saudi Arabia has done remarkably well. The Saudi Arabia has a vision 2030 with which they were aiming to double the gross domestic product, but so far they have even surpassed the expectation. The Saudi Arabia is a country that have done very well in infrastructure financing in private sector, getting involved in mobilizing private capital, both domestically and internationally. And those are the kind of things Mr. President is leading us to. Mr. President's remarks were well received more particularly his assurance that Nigeria is open for business. Investors are welcome. An elated business council following the interactions with the Nigerian side, which consists of Mr. President, under the leadership of Mr. President, consisting of ministers, senior government officials, diplomats, private sector, and the same on the Saudi Arabian side, the Saudi Arabian business community were impressed and they agreed to quickly come to visit Nigeria. And this is uh, the senior or the, the most important companies in different sectors of Saudi Arabian 
business establishment from energy to power to logistics to investments and name it so it was a very remarkable uh achievement that nigeria is now accepted as a uh, as a destination of choice and more importantly the reforms that our country are undertaking are impressing investors around the world thank you um, abu bakar Tiku, uh, for uh, your opening comments there on the summit uh, i'd like to get to uh, minasara now who's uh, right here in the studio uh, you heard uh, the ambassador uh, you know the ambassador yaya lawal uh, talk about uh, the takeaways from the summit and then you also heard the minister uh, talk about you know some of the achievements and then uh, the prospects that the summit brings uh, you have been following uh, you know this uh, particular um, you know summit w while the president was there and then now with all the comments being made about the summit what's your view yes uh, first of all i would like to <coughs> congratulate the government of the federation of nigeria uh, we have succeeded in achieving the very very good and not the so good uh the the revels from the saudi summit the good side of it is that we have discharged one of our fundamental constitutional obligations uh, section 19 of the constitution of the federal republic of nigeria has encapsulated six provisions the first provision is that our foreign policy drive must be centered on the interests and aspirations of the Nigerian citizens. And that one is predicated on section 14, subsection 1, that says sovereignty belongs to the people. And then the second one is that Nigeria should strive as much as possible to take a lead in anything that is African. Nigeria should strive to be what, quote and unquote, we call the giant in Africa. Uh, we are seeing Nigeria going there as the leader of the delegation of over 50 countries. As a matter of fact, President Tinubu was a co-chair there, which uh, my brothers didn't mention, was a co-chair of the summit. And uh, all other African countries were uh, queuing behind Nigeria. The third provision under Section 19 is that it is an obligation on us to participate in international matters engagements in international bodies in international cooperations in international things so this uh, uh, diplomatic trajectory we have been seeing is part of the discharge of that obligation uh, the fourth section has to do with our ability to accept whatever is the result coming out of such international engagements whether positive or negative whether it's a court sanction or whether it's a, a business loan or whether it's a, whatever it is, we are under obligation to take. Then the final one is that we are to participate in the economic cooperation and other diplomatic maneuvers to ensure world peace and international understanding. Uh, so Nigeria in the first place is going there to discharge this constitutional obligation, which is highly remarkable. The second aspect of it is, which I highlighted, we reinforce our leadership status at the continental level. We reinforce that Nigeria is indeed the leader of Africa. And whenever you are talking of Africa, the first entry point is Nigeria. We have concretized that one. The third one has to do with uh, the fact that uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is seeing what other countries in the world are doing. With the advent of this millennium, if you observe, United States Africa relations is opened, uh, China African relations opened, Japan Africa relations opened, uh, Soviet Union Africa relations opened, rather uh, Russia, Russia, this, there is no Soviet Union now, India African uh, relations opened, and then uh, Saudi African relations opened. Now, during this uh, conference so many things you know came to the front burner over 50 different treaties and agreements were signed in the areas of investments in the areas of technical cooperations in the areas of global peace 
For example, one of the decisions was that all the countries of both Saudi Arabia and Africa should really see to amnesties, in other words, halting of the conflict in the uh, uh, Middle East, especially in relation to where it is affecting women, uh, innocent children and civilian population. That one is a fundamental, you know, bold step that the summit has really brought about. The second one has to do with uh, the establishment of a lot of investments, uh, over $200 billion investments in African continent. And uh, one of the remarkable things is that Nigeria's refineries will be revamped, uh, even though it's under uh, BOT, Build, Operate and Transfer which I am more comfortable to it than uh, what happened during Omar Musayar Adua's time. For example, when Saudi offered to give us assistance to revamp the distance, and at the end, termites finished the money, and we didn't get the refineries revamped. So this one is a very good positive thing. They are the ones to come and rebuild the refineries, operate them for a sizable time, and then when we have really seen the uh, 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 way to do it, then they now transfer to us ultimately. That is very good. Another remarkable thing is uh, the call by the Saudi government for concretization of democracy in Africa. Um, it is, I'm not comfortable with the presence of the uh, new leader of Gabon who came through the barrels of gun. He was there at the meeting and he was admitted. But I believe uh, 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 Jojo is better than Wowo. Uh, I believe it's a very good uh, uh, diplomatic move, and uh, they must have accepted some of the terms and conditions given to them, sequel to which uh, the African Development Bank and some other institutions have started relaxing the sanctions imposed. I think that should really go around all the other uh, uh, anti-democratic forces in Africa in order for us to have uniformity of democratic oppressions. Now, coming to the other side that I said is not so much, uh, I'm not so much comfortable with it, is that in the month of November 1884 down to February 1885, there was scramble for the continent of Africa by the countries of the world. Uh, the summit was held in Berlin, present-day Germany, where countries now decided to partition Africa for economic and political control. Yeah. Now, programming to the advent of this millennium, uh, I'm afraid I'm seeing scramble for Africa's uh, economic investments uh, by different uh, parts of the globe. And uh, my own main point of disillusionment has to do with the fact that uh, uh, we are seeing a blow to our individual country's sovereignty whereby you discover that uh, uh, United States, for example, Japan, India, Russia, and now Saudi Arabia, instead of dealing with us individually, uh, they are taking Africa as one block. Uh, uh, that is a strategy to exploit our inherent internal differences. Because internally, Africa is yet to be united. Uh, economically, politically, we need to have sound uniformity of political system. We need to have integrated economic uh, 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 system. We need to have clearly a well orchestrated foreign policy blueprint that will make Africa to be going there to be speaking as one block. That will make Africa to sit down. African countries should be sitting down to be discussing before they go into okay, such okay, meetings. Okay, okay. Yes. Thank you very much for your thoughts there. We're coming back to you. And I know that your major fo uh, point here is that uh, Africa has become the focal point for superpowers like Which Russia, of our yes, Russia, uh, the, uh, US, China, and now Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Now let's, let's join uh, the conversation with uh, Ambassador Usman. Uh, Ambassador Usman, uh, if you are hearing, if you can hear us, uh, I want to ask uh, this question. How can the outcome of this Saudi uh, Arabia summit uh, be effectively utilized to promote um, economic growth in the African continent. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for this very question. Much. 
Uh, what we should do as Africans, particularly as Nigeria, is to be coordinated and well organized. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm glad that you have on the program the Honorable Minister of National Planning, uh, His Excellency El Haji Bagudu. He, as the key national planning agent in Nigeria, can organize, can organize interministerial uh, discussions in order to really concretize the agreements that have been reached at the summit in Riyadh. Uh, the take-off take point of this discussion should be the Riyadh Declaration of 10th November that really address sector by sector the agreements that have been reached at the summit level, beginning with uh, the issue in Gaza, uh, which is the security and military situation that is uh, going on right now. And then it looked into the issue of development, bilateral development between Africa and Saudi Arabia, and then into other issues about five or six different clusters, including counterterrorism and so forth. So I think it's very important that each of these clusters should be looked at according to the mandates of every ministry. And then we should have a coordinated task force that will proffer exact and time-bound recommendations to the federal government in order to implement them. I think the summit has also, the Riyadh summit has also established five or six working groups or clusters dealing with uh, security, military, to counter terrorism, dealing with health, dealing with uh, culture and civilization, dealing with development, and also, I think, energy security and so forth. So we look at these clusters and then appropriate or apportion responsibilities to our own ministries in terms of bringing up concrete actions that will address the decisions reached and the way forward as far as Nigeria is concerned. Uh, it is important that the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of National Planning and Finance, should take the lead for obvious reasons, because that summit was a development summit, and development summits have specific context in which the results or decisions are to be realized. So it's very important for us between now and the end of January to come up with some focused decisions and recommendations to Mr. President to approve so that when the Saudi Arabia-Nigeria Business Roundtable, for instance, meets, we will have concrete programs to advance to them for discussion. Beyond that also, it is very important that we imbibe the culture of discipline in the public service. It is very important, for instance, if we reach agreement, whether bilateral or multilateral, with other foreign entities, these agreements should be considered as sacrosanct, to be implemented with regularity, consistency, and precision. That will lead to results and reflect positive, positively and favorably on the image of Nigeria. We cannot go and sign agreements overseas, come back home and dump those agreements in the larger jungle of the public service or the bureaucracy. It is important that we respect decisions. Saudi Arabia, their public service is very coherent, very meticulous, very precise in their action. Decisions start, actually policy starts from bottom up and once a decision is taken at the higher level, there can be no derogation from that. Implementation will be timely, precise, and meticulous. And where failure emanates, disciplinary action will be taken against people, even if at the level of ministers. So we too, we should be very focused in those elements in order to bring back respectability and credibility into the public service. I'm happy the Honorable Minister of National Planning is here, and I am sure in his briefings of the Federal Executive Council and the Cabinet, and particularly in his discussion with Mr. President, he will be able to raise this issue of coordination, system-wide coherence, respect for time, and respect for decisions, and for ministries to, should come up with implementation strategies. And moreover, 
Anything that we do in Abuja, please let us invite the Nigerian ambassador in Saudi, Ar Saudi Arabia to be part of the discussion. He will bring the local peculiarities of the governance in Saudi Arabia and advise on the best processes and means for the implementation of decisions and agreements whereby the embassy itself, the ambassador himself, can now be part of the articulation and advocacy of the final decisions that we have taken in Nigeria in order to concretize the outcomes of such policies. And also the media, NTA, you have taken the lead, which is very important. Other media houses and organizations in Nigeria should give vent publicity to why relationship with Saudi Arabia is very important. I think if I have the opportunity, I will give you some information, some statistics on the importance of Saudi Arabia in the larger global network, and particularly in Africa, and more so to Nigeria. Thanks, um, Ambassador Usman uh, Saraki, uh, for your thoughts there. Um, we'll uh, definitely get back to you, but for now, let's uh, uh, speak with um, Abubakar Atiku, the Minister of Budget and Economic Planning. I, I, I'm sure. I'm sure you heard, um, you know, um, Ambassador Usman and uh, Minasara Kogo, you know, share their thoughts about uh, the summit. So the first question I want to ask you now is, <coughs> as regards what Minasara said, uh, countries um, are now dealing with Africa as a block instead of, um, you know, individual countries. Does that worry you? you know, um, I mean, looking at the fact that Nigeria has what it takes, you know, to deal with these countries um, on an individual level. And then, do you really think that the takeaways from this summit uh, would not just earn with words? Do you see them translating into actions? Because you just heard Usman talk about the fact that we have issues in our public service. We have other issues affecting investors in this country, I'm sure you're aware. Uh, the power sector, uh, of course, is a big issue. Uh, security is there. So many issues. So do you really think that some of these um, uh, talks and then um, agreements that have been signed would actually uh, translate uh, to action that we'll get to see um, in Nigeria? Thank you once again. First, on the second question, whatever we are experiencing have been experienced by other countries. But globally, countries as well as develop development partners, the private sector, is always impressed by show of leadership. Not the absence of problems or challenges, but leadership that acknowledges those challenges and is willing to confront them and provide opportunities for the private sector that will take opportunities in spite of those challenges. Sometimes those, those challenges are even the primary reason why the private sector is motivated. Somebody may want to come to Nigeria because it's a big market, and he wants he or she wants to participate in the power sector. So the, what is uh, said to be a, a, a problem is an opportunity, and the president is marketing it as such rightfully. Equally, even the issue of security, countries have dealt with security challenges at different times in their development. And what those countries, experience from those countries have shown that you provide leadership to deal with the challenges like security and also at the same time disaggregate because when you say there is insecurity and you are being truthful about it, it does not mean there are no places in the country which are safe for investors. While the other places that are unsafe are being dealt with. I, I, I even I, I forgot to mention this. Mr. President also traveled among his delegation with three state governors, the governors of Niger State, Katina State, and Bauchi State. All of them participated. All of them spoke about the gains that have been made and how investors can now participate in the economic opportunities in their states. 
given the improvements that are being recorded daily. So all the uh, challenges that have affect, are affecting us or have affected us, we have best of experience. And Saudi Arabia is one of those countries that understand these challenges very well. And the they shared, in, in spite of that, they quickly came to the view that the potentials of Nigeria are greater than the challenges. And they are very, very confident in the leadership and commendable steps that have been taken so far and they see being taken always. Secondly, as to the point where countries are now relating with Africa, let us appreciate that diplomacy or relationship between country is an evolving phenomena. Now, technology and the quest for investment have made countries able to communicate with a group of countries. And it's not, it, it's not suggestive of any diminution of status of such countries. We have seen European countries, we have seen uh, um, uh, Asian countries interacting with group of countries. We have seen this, uh, Russia, we, we have seen formation of other blocks. What is important is to be done with respect, with reciprocity, and to provide the opportunity for the countries to market their potentials. And, but more importantly, for those marketing opportunities or those engagements to result in additional investment. I believe the engagement with Saudi Arabia will result in additional investments in Nigeria further to what, what uh, Saudi Arabia has done before. And at this time in our national life, that's what we want so that we can create more opportunities for our citizens. And uh, we want more, again, to provide opportunities for our citizens to engage with countries. Somebody wants, we have had Nigerians playing in Saudi Arabia. They are all welcome. We want more of them. We want, so as much as we want Saudi Arabians to invest on us, we also want opportunities for Nigerians in Saudi Arabia. And I believe this engagement, uh, even the, though the first of its kind, Saudi, Saudi Africa Summit highlights the importance of Nigeria rather than the other way around. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister for Budget and Economic Planning, uh, Abubakar Atiku Bagudu, for your thoughts there. But if you listened to the uh, conversation of the Ambassador Usman earlier, he suggested that uh, a coordinating tax force to be uh, put in place for proper implementation of uh, most of the agreement. Uh, from your own uh, perspective, from your own view, can you give us specifics uh, or the specific initiatives that were proposed at the summit to address some of these challenges? Well, like I said, the, the ambassador has done a, job, a, a good job in summarizing what have been discussed at the summit, particularly on a continental level, on a non-economic level, but I'm focusing more on what the president has achieved for the country. Uh, the president, like I said, was there with three state governors showing the importance to Mr. President all the time and consistent with tradition of giving state governors as, feder as part of, uh, as federating units as well, the opportunity to share in marketing Nigeria. Equally, we have gotten commitments by the Saudi Arabia leadership to support the economic reforms of Mr. President. Furthermore, the support by the Saudi Arabian private sector and Islamic Development Bank. The business council was attended by the state governors, by the uh, ministers, by the private sector. And the coordinating minister of the economy was there. The minister of trade and investment was there. 
and the um the the budget and economy planning ministry is responsible amongst its mandate for bilateral economic relationship is the custodian of our national planning system so mr president have always emphasized that the cabinet is a team and the coordinating minister of the economy has taken the step to ensure that what was agreed was coordinated so as so that the visits both by the saudi arabian private sector and the what is called the Ar arab coordinating council which is made up of the islamic development bank and other development finance institutions of uh, of the middle east who are promised to put 50 billion dollars in nigeria in in africa to support the achievement of the sustainable development goals by 2030 also such visits take place so steps have already been taken and they are being coordinated by both the government with with both the government and the private sector Thanks, uh, Abubakar Atikubagudu there. Uh, so I'll just uh, quickly get back to Ambassador Usman. Um, you, heard, you heard the minister, uh, you know, speak there and uh, talking about the fact that uh, despite the challenges, uh, you know, these investors will be able to, uh, you know, turn uh, some of the agreements, if you like, some of the talks into reality, um, you know, for us and, of course, uh, boost our economy. But I just want to find out your thoughts about, uh, you know, uh, the revamping of um, our refineries. Uh, that's a big issue, and it's uh, a big masquerade, really, because if we can uh, fix our refineries, a lot of things will go right in this country. Do you really think uh, that with the kind of agreement that has been signed so far, um, there's uh, light you know uh, for our refineries or do you think it will go the way of other um, agreements uh, that have uh, happened in the past thank you very much um i i i am not particularly worried that we will not get anything tangible out of this initiative with saudi arabia in fact I am confident that if we do our homework right and we organize ourselves correctly, we will get a lot of traction and benefit from our relationship with Saudi Arabia. The issue of refinery is just one element that came up in the discussion, whether commitments have been made or not, and there was a big discussion in social media with respect to that. If indeed a commitment has been received from the Saudis, I think it is very important for the Minister of Petroleum Resources and the NNPC uh, to really coordinate and come up with a blueprint for either the renovation of one or two of our refineries or indeed the construction of a new one. The Saudis have the money, they have the experience, ex expertise and technology to do that. They have, they have some of the biggest refineries in the world and some of the biggest oil and gas facilities in the world. And they have been consistently dealing with production and distribution of refined products for the last 50 or so years. So they have a vast experience in that area. The problem is our own side, really. I'm sorry to say, I'm not criticizing the government or anyone for that matter, but the history of refining in Nigeria in the last 20 or 25 years has left a lot to be desired. And we need to be really honest with ourselves. We have four refineries that we have abandoned. And we have a very big, huge project, the Dangote refinery, that is coming up. Let us ask ourselves, do we need a new refinery? If we do need a refinery, we should convince ourselves why we need that refinery. And if we don't need a new refinery, then we ask ourselves, is it cost effective to renovate and revamp the four existing refineries in order to modernize them and bring, bring them up to optimal production? I think these are questions that experts should answer, not general policy uh, practitioners like us. Uh, the other issue is, does Saudi Arabia have the capacity to finance refinery building in Nigeria? The answer is yes. Saudi Arabia, its own 
public investment fund, for instance, which is like the Sovereign Wealth Fund, is worth $700 billion. $700 billion. Saudi Arabia's foreign reserve is about $450 billion. Its GDP is over a trillion dollars. So they have the money, really, to undertake a small project of 10 to 20 billion dollars uh, you know, in Nigeria. They can do that. But it all depends on our own preparedness, our own commitment, our own precision in organization, and what are the objectives and targets that we, we wish to achieve. Beyond refineries, I think Nigeria can gain a lot in the relationship with Saudi Arabia in the area of food security. Saudi Arabia is a big country, more than twice the size of Nigeria, but it has only about 46 million people. Seven million or so of those are foreigners working uh, in that country. Saudi Arabia is an agriculturally deficient country. It doesn't have water uh, resources like we do. Rainfall is very sparse and far between. They don't have big permanent rivers or lakes like we do. They tried in, in the 2000s to see if they could produce wheat in the country from desalinated water. That proved to be very costly, expensive, and unsustainable. And I think they are going to abandon it in the long term. So they are looking for land overseas in countries like Ethiopia, Sudan, Mali, Egypt, Sudan, and places like that in order to produce food for their, uh, for their population. Where we can come in now is to sign concrete agreements with them in the area of agriculture, water resources management, food security, livestock, and fisheries. Nigeria can meet a substantial portion of the food needs of Saudi Arabia in terms of grains, fruits, vegetables, beef, meat, uh, mutton, goat, fish, and so forth. But we have to be more organized, we have to plan better, and we have to really know how to establish the logistics, packaging and improvement of quality in order to seize the opportunity that their market presents to us. The other point is Saudi Arabia can come in to develop our infrastructure. Today in Nigeria, we have confessed that we don't have money. We are virtually uh, on the point of really having difficulty in payment in meeting our internal commitments. So that means we do not have funds to commit to large-scale infrastructure. A country that supported our infrastructure development like China is getting wary of us in terms of our capacity to repay and the intricacies of uh, the deals that we went through with them, which really appeared surprising to them. So we have to look for alternative sources of funding of large-scale infrastructure. Saudi Arabia can provide that. The $500 billion uh, that they think uh, they announced they will commit to, uh, to Africa between now and 2030, I think you know, we can uh, ask for more, a substantial proportion of that fund to come into development of infrastructure like seaports, our transmission grid, our airports, our roads, highways, and other things. They can do it if we are focused, we, are, we, are, we, we, are, we properly plan you know, those projects, and we prove to them that we can manage them and pay back some of these things. The Saudi Arabia Development Fund and the Saudi Bank for Development alone can commit about $500 billion to Africa because of the commitment emanating from the recently held summit. So it is very important also for us to take note of the round table, business round table meeting at which our private sector organizations and Mr. President participated. And especially the bilateral meeting between His Excellency President Bola Metinubu and the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Very important discussions took place we don't know the entire range of the uh, report of the discussions, but I will assume those who are present will appreciate the magnitude of those discussions and come up with minutes of the meeting, the memorandum of the minute uh, of the meeting, and establish frameworks for the pursuit of those agreements 
by actually entering into formal diplomatic communication with Saudi Arabia through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, through their embassy here, and through our embassy to communicate to them our needs, requirements, and demands, and convey to them our readiness to engage with them constructively, honestly, transparently, for the mutual benefit of the two countries. I think we can do that. The president is committed. His ministers are committed. So we have to turn around the public service, particularly the civil service, to reorient it towards achieving goals, removing malpractices, and also respecting times and commitments entered into between Nigeria and other governments. Ambassador, um, Ambassador uh, Usman Sarki for your thoughts there and uh, you have given us a focal point which is that uh, we need to the need for us to be able to benefit from these uh, commitments to Africa and that has to do with our preparedness our uh, ability to be committed to all the agreements. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a break now. The conversation continues shortly. Stay with us. Yeah, welcome back. You're still on to Good Morning Nigeria on the NTA uh, network service. Uh, we're still talking, uh, our conversation this morning is still on Saudi uh, Arabia African Summit. And uh, we still have in our studio, uh, me, Nasara. Now, you listened to the... Uh, to the thoughts of the uh, ambassador there, Usman, and he spoke on the need for us to put our house together in order for us to benefit from this uh, 50 billion uh, dollars uh, pledge that Saudi has uh, committed for Africa. So how do you think that Nigeria can take advantage of this pledge to have, uh, to, to have a sustainable development, uh, economic development goal for it? Uh, for it. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I'm glad that uh, the seven major areas of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, have been touched, uh, cutting length and breadth of Africa to benefit. Uh, in other words, agriculture, health care, investments in the energy sector, petroleum resources, security, the question of democracy. Then the last one, the international, that has to do with the peace in the uh, Palestinian region. Now, and for Nigeria to benefit, there are five steps that should be taken. Mm. If you remember, President Buhari, during his eight-year period, succeeded in signing bilateral and multilateral agreements, over 800 different agreements. But they ended up in drain because we didn't go into taking them in accordance with these technical settings. The first one, which is fundamental, uh, because the Constitution is five water. Section 12 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria said that no agreement you will sign with any country, any organization, or anybody, Nigeria will not benefit from such agreements, except to the extent to which those agreements have been domesticated. And under Section 12 of the Constitution, like I said, it said that those agreements should be brought before the Senate of the Federal Republic for you to have two-thirds of them signing, agreeing that they are in agreement with those, agreement, with those uh, uh, articles of treaties that have been signed. Now, we have not seen the successive ministers of justice you know, coordinating with the Foreign Affairs Ministry, the Minister of Justice, Foreign Affairs Minister, and the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, who is the head of the Cabinet Secretariat, should coordinate and bring forward these things before the National Assembly. Uh, luckily, we have a good relationship between the executive and the legislature. I do not think there will be any problem in them assenting to those agreements. By the time you now sign these things, then you come to the second level. The second will be interministerial conference. Those ministries that are relevant to the agreement signed should be able to come together to say yes. Now the National Assembly has done their own by signing and agreeing that they are now part of the laws of Nigeria to implement these treaties. On the basis of which this, uh, 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 every minister will come with uh, the technical expert that form the components of a particular agreement that is there. So they will now embody it as a committee of the whole to now discuss and then digest the decision. Then on the basis of which they will now say, okay, in the area of so-so-so respect, 
we have so 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 technocrats outside there you invite them and add them there in the area of so 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 respect we have so 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 money bags that can come and invest because they have been running enterprise in this sector for a period of 10 20 30 years in the interest of nigeria yeah now you now bring the businessmen you now bring them in you now bring the technocrats there that is what will form what we call technical committee it is the technical committee that will now bring out the strategies the strategies on how to implement each and every component of that agreement. Now, under the strategies, you now digest and cascade them into various components. There is the ministerial aspect, there is the technical aspect, there is the presidential aspect, and there is the ambassadorial aspect. Now, do you now decide on which, under which of these four components will this particular matter fall, you fall it there. Under which component will this particular matter come, you fall. Then from there you come into what uh, His Excellency Ambassador Usman Sarki is talking about, the time frame. You now talk about the time frame. Uh, when do we want to begin to derive benefit from these uh, uh, agreements? Then how much period of review do we put there in the distance? Then you now go about it. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Trade and Investment, the Minister of uh, Economic Planning, mm. and other relevant ministers that are German to these agreements will not be able to meet the relevant authorities at the Saudi end. And then you should be able to fast track this before the return visit. Not return visit since it's not bilateral, it's a multilateral engagement. Now, the president will not be advised to in initiate a bilateral visit to Saudi Kingdom. When he now do during the bilateral visit, he will not be able to bring up those things that, uh, yes, uh, 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 at our level, this is how far we have gone. Then Saudi too will now bring and do peer comparison of their own arrangements on the basis of which technical partners in the form of either minister of this and minister of this or so 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 investor from this country so 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 investor from this country these ones will now probe minds and now come to a practical implementation and that is when you will now begin to see the implementation of this in the interest of the the two countries and uh, the financial institutions that will be involved the Saudi Investment Development Fund, the African Development Bank, the Nigeria Central Bank, or any other institution that is relevant to the DC will now be bring into the fold. And now decision will now be done regarding whether what quantum of uh, 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 expatriates involvement should be in that respect. Where and where, what percentage of Nigerians, either Nigerians raw materials or Nigerians uh, 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 human capital will be involved in that. Then the head of the president should be able to now set off uh, a very serious monitoring and evaluation mechanism so that uh, constantly there will be evaluation of the progress in respect of the implementation of the agreements and corresponding reports coming back to the president on the basis of which he will now be asking questions and now be injecting some other ideas on how to first, first track this thing so that we'll be able so this is the really the missing link that we we, 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 we have been experiencing over a long period of periods and that is the reason why you will see a uh, president will go into a sergeant signing the distance uh, at the end of it to remain in the archives the agreements will remain there or you will go there for uh, you know two days meeting and then they end up spending two weeks shopping and at the same time when they come back they will not engage the bureaucracy towards setting of the technical machinery for implementation. Many thanks, uh, Minasa. And of course, uh, Ambassador Usman actually you know, made uh, some comments as regards that earlier, you know, talking about the fact that uh, the public service would need uh, a total reform uh, for some of uh, these agreements uh, to actually work. You know, that, that leads me to my next question as, as regards, um, you know, dependence of Africa on, you know, some of these countries. Do you really think that's the way to go? You know, you, you made mention of the fact that China is becoming aware of its investments in Nigeria. Uh, what's the guarantee that these other countries, you know, that are calling on Africa now would also not get, I mean, want to pack their bags and go too? So don't you think that it's high time that Nigeria and of course other African countries begin to look inward and probably work together uh, so they can solve some of their challenges? What are your thoughts, Ambassador Usman? Thank you very much. I think the eight-point economic agenda of His Excellency President Bola Metunubu 
encapsulates this philosophy of looking inwards. But at the same time, we have to realize that no country can be a box whereby you can lock that box, throw the key, and that country survives. All of us are linked, intertwined, through globalization, the advance of science and technology, trade, transport, and so forth, and the movement of capital and finance. It is important for us to be precise in rationalization of our interest. We need to know between now and 2030 where we are taking Nigeria towards. In which direction is this country going? We need to really plan and map our strategies in terms of taking the country forward. There is no gain in actually looking inward without actually looking at the global context in which we operate. It is very important for us, first and foremost, to determine how we can finance projects. We don't have money, we don't have foreign exchange, we don't have foreign currency, our foreign reserves are low, our external debts are getting high. And even internal debts owed to local contractors and business people is very high. How do we get out of this quandary in order to have enough resources in order to buy things that we need which we do not produce and to pay for services that are rendered to us by foreign countries. The answer to that is financial discipline and to combat corruption honestly, fearlessly and rigorously. These are the two things that we need. And the third one is to bring down the cost of go governance. We are spending too much in this country on overhead, on trivialities. There is an outcry in Nigeria today about the cost of governance. Honestly, we need to do something about that. We need to beef up our foreign reserves, we need to bring down our external debts, and we need to really develop the capacity and have the wherewithal whereby we can inject funds into infrastructure development and human capital development, poverty eradication, creating jobs and other things. Where there is a deficit in financing, then we can turn to institutions like the Africa Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, and to foreign partners. So if we introduce a measure of discipline in the management of the economy, transparency in the discharge of budgetary responsibilities, and also in terms of commitment of our, a meeting of our commitments, then countries like China, Russia, India, the EU, United States, Saudi Arabia, and others will take us seriously. And whatever we propose to them, they will see the transparency and genuineness of the ideas we are proffering to them and come to our support. But we need to create the internal dynamics to help, for instance, if there is too much labor unrest because of uh, cost of living, there is very high inflation, there is shortage of food and things like that, you find that we are going to be overwhelmed by these challenges and we will not be in a position to be focused on the detailed elements of development that will carry our country forward. We need to build up our military capacity, our military capabilities, our defense capabilities. In fact, we need to be manufacturing many of these components of defense and military capability in Nigeria. Saudi Arabia and the Gulf Arab states are doing so today. They are adding value to their defense capacity. If you do not have a reasonable level of internal self-sufficiency in the area of defense, you are vulnerable to a lot of challenges and issues, as we have used, uh, witnessed in the last 15 years, because of Boko Haram insurgency, banditry, and other things. So the eight-point agenda of President Tinobu can be the check-off point from where we can really internalize development, and as well as seeking the correct and appropriate path for external relationship with countries like Saudi Arabia. We need precision, we need internal dynamics that will lead to coordination, systems coherence, and transparency of policy. I agree with Al-Hajjimu Inasara that the National Assembly should be brought on board 
immediately we return from summits like that, a minister or the SGF or the chief of staff to the president or some designated senior official should go to the National Assembly to brief the honorable members of the House of, Assembly, uh, House of Reps and the distinguished senators about the outcomes and the processes in order for them to realize the vitality and the importance of such engagements. And whenever they are called upon to meet their own end of the bargain in terms of passage of bills or approving of appropriations, they will do so from the knowledge that they have been taken into the confidence of the government. The other issue is for the sub-national levels to be brought on board. I am happy that three state governors were taken by Mr. President in his entourage to the Saudi Arabian meeting. It is important that a special meeting, maybe a council of states, should be convened to brief uh, governors because invariably any project that will be established will be done in one of the states or some of the states. So the governors should know what is at stake, what is in the pipeline, what is in the offing, in order also for them to contribute towards fashioning a policy and establishment of priorities and timelines towards achieving the desired objectives. Ambassador Usman Sarki, thank you so much for your thoughts there. You have highlighted a lot of uh, measures that we need to take for us to be able to have uh, full benefits uh, of, of, that, uh, of, of the fund. On that note, we want to thank you very much for taking part in today's conversation. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Minasara, you listened to the ambassador there, and he, and he listened to so, and he, sp he spoke on so many things that we need to do, uh, which is rationalizing our priorities, the issue of uh, the need to combat corruption, and also bringing down the cost of governance. Uh, your parting shots now. I mean, having listened to that, what do you think the government needs to do? Yes, the government needs to immediately make sure that all the ministers all the ministers submit to the president not later than december this year detailed blueprint of what they want to achieve the office of the secretary to the government of the federation has enormous responsibility in this context in 1985 the name of the office was changed from secretary to the gov federal government to government of the federation federal government means government at the federal level Government of the Federation means you either want to coordinate all the activities at the federal level, the state level, and the local government level. So governmental activities should be able to cascade from top to the bottom. In other words, you should involve all the governors, and that is the reason why we have National Council, Economic Council, whereby all the governors will come. So they should be brought in in policy formulation, and they should be brought in in policy execution as well as appraisal of policies. All right, many thanks, uh, Amin yes. because of time, I think we'll have to leave the conversation at that point. Mm. Uh, many thanks, Amin Nasser, Kogo Umar, the international you. analyst on democracy and governance. Thank you for joining us. We also had with us the Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, at uh, Abu Bakar Ateku Bagudu, uh, who joined us for the conversation. Many thanks uh, uh, to all our guests this morning. So now time to have uh, a bit on sports news. Nigeria Super Eagles once again dropped points in the Group C. In their Group C 2026 FIFA World Cup qualifiers after the forced Warriors of Zimbabwe to a 1-1 one -one draw in Rwanda on Sunday, the encounter saw the Eagles come from a goal down to draw in the second game running following the 1-1 one -one scoreline with Lesotho on match day one. New invitee Nathan Tala made his debut for the Eagles as it was named in the starting 11 before going off before the start of the second half for goal scorer Kelechi Henacho. Despite the draw, Nigeria remained second in Group C of the World Cup qualifying series, a point behind South Africa, while Zimbabwe stay in third. The next game in the qualifiers for the Eagles will be a home game against South Africa on 2nd June 2024.
Meanwhile, Nigeria's Falcons have made it to the playoff round of the 2024 FIFA Women's World Cup qualifiers in Sunday's third round second leg tie against Tanzania at the MKO Abiola Stadium in Abuja. The Falcons won 2-1 to advance 3-2 on aggregate. And in tennis, Novak Djokovic won a record seventh ATP Finals title with a dominant victory over Janik Sinner that marked another milestone in his memorable season. The Serb 36 who lost to the Italian in the group stage avenged that with a 6-3, 6-3 win in Turin, Italy. It is another historic night. Thanks, Lucia, for that uh, sports uh, package. And that's uh, good morning, Nigeria, today. Many thanks for joining us. We hope to see you tomorrow. I'm Henry John. And I'm Ademola Adiyo. Thank you very much for watching, and have a great week. Good morning.